som är Peter Hammarstedt, kapten på eh, fartyget Bob Barker eh, med organisationen Sea Shepherd. Han har varit aktiv och drivande där i 13 år och kommer att berätta för oss om deras kampanjer och arbete. Och vi tänkte börja med att visa en film på åtta minuter och eh, sen så kommer Peter komma upp. Och den, eh, både filmen och föredraget kommer att hållas på engelska för att vi har lite internationella läsare här. The Sea Shepherd, M.Y. Bob Barker and M.Y. Sam Simon sailed to Antarctica for Operation Icefish. It was the first campaign of its kind for Sea Shepherd, devised to fill a law enforcement void in Antarctic waters, which was being exploited by Antarctic and Patagonian toothfish poachers. Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish are top predators in the Antarctic ecosystem. They fill the function that sharks do off the coast of Australia. Better known as Chilean sea bass, their high value in the remoteness of the Southern Ocean has led to poachers targeting these fish that are referred to as white gold. Uh, these toothfish are vulnerable fish populations that are being targeted by six illegal toothfish operators that operate outside the full reach of the law. It was these poachers that were the target of Operation Icefish. Around 10 o'clock in the evening, the Bob Barker intercepted the most notorious of the six poachers, Nigerian flagged FV Thunder, fishing within the Kamala Zone, an international marine life management area in Antarctica. Uh, we found the Thunder fishing in a Kamala region. They're not licensed to fish down here. There's an Interpol purple notice issued for this vessel. We've told the vessel that they're under arrest and we've told them to go to Fremantle, Australia. The players will stay with the Thunder. We're going to report their coordinates now to the Australian Federal Police and to Interpol. Uh, we're then going to stand by and if they do resume illegal fishing, then we're going to physically shut them down. Thunder refused and sailed in a northwesterly direction with Bob Barker in hot pursuit. Sam Simon, the crew inspected three markets that Thunder abandoned when it fled, discovering 25 kilometers of illegal gilnet. For over five days, the 30-strong crew worked around the clock to retrieve the illegal net. On completion of the retrieval, a second monster gilnet was located. Retrieval operations began again as the crew remained determined to rid the pristine Antarctic waters of these walls of death. In total, Captain C. Chakravarti and the crew of the Sam Simon confiscated a mammoth 72 kilometers of a legal net. So our job has been to pick up the pieces after the Bob Barker chased the vessels out of their fishing grounds and clean up Antarctica off this gear that would otherwise continue to destroy and kill marine life. Over 1,400 toothfish were found dead in the recovered gillnets. Many were reproductive females carrying eggs. There were also rays, jellyfish, crabs and grenadines. It was the first time that any conservation organisation had managed such a recovery, confiscation and documentation of such huge lengths of illegal fishing. Having completed the retrieval operations, the Sam Simon intercepted yet another two poaching vessels in Australian waters, the Yongding and the Kunlun, both with illegal fishing gear. I must remind you again that you are fishing illegally in these waters and I will not allow you to continue with your fishing. Sam Simon pursued the Kumon and on the 8th of February successfully drove them out of their hunting grounds. On February 25th, the Sam Simon arrived in Mauritius to hand over the illegal nets to Mauritian authorities as evidence. Meanwhile, the Bob Barker continued its pursuit of Thunder and stayed committed to escorting them to authorities at the next port. 
Operation Icefish developed into a campaign that went far beyond the issues that Sea Shepherd had anticipated. We came to suspect that there was human trafficking on board the Thunder when we learned more about the dynamic between these illegal fishing vessels and the people that they bring on board the ship to do the real dirty and, and dangerous work. Thunder had been deregistered by its flag state, Nigeria, for violations of its registry conditions, an action that meant that Thunder was officially a stateless pirate vessel. On April 6th, after a 110 day sea chase, the captain of Thunder issued a distress alert and ordered his crew members to the life rafts. Sea Shepherd vessels responded immediately and coordinated a search and rescue operation. All 40 crew members were rescued by Sea Shepherd and received by the Sam Simon. Attention all crew, attention all crew. Uh, looks like the Thunder's going down. Looks like the Thunder's going down. Shepherd maintains that Thunder was intentionally scut in an effort to hide its cargo of illegally caught toothfish. The crew of Thunder were handed over to authorities in Sao Tome and Principe, located off the west coast of Africa. Six months later, the captain and two officers of Thunder were convicted and sentenced to jail for recklessness and forgery, and fined 15 million euros for pollution and damage to the environment. The success of Operation Icefish defied any expectations. Not only did we finally stop the career of the Thunder as a poaching vessel, a vessel that had been poaching in the Antarctic for 10 years, out of the six ships that we went to take on at the start of the campaign, four of them, four out of the six, are being finally held accountable for their criminal activity. Our crews tripled the record for the longest maritime pursuit in modern history and set the record for the recovery and confiscation of illegal fishing gear by a conservation organisation. Most importantly, the lives of countless toothfish and other marine creatures were saved thanks to Sea Shepherd's direct action intervention. With ongoing determination, Sea Shepherd has once again fought for justice and sent a clear message to those seeking to destroy our oceans. Poaching will not be tolerated in Antarctic waters. Out of the band of six, two toothfish poaching vessels remain at large. On Operation Icefish 2, the Sea Shepherd vessel, Steve Irwin, will track down these poaching vessels, will shut down their criminal operations, and will deliver them to the halls of justice. Hej, jag heter Rickard Söderberg och eh, jag är en ganska svår imponerad kille. Jag jobbade nyligen med Roger Waters och det tog mig två dagar att fatta att de här bandhistorierna han snackade om var Pink Floyd. Och då tog man nog googlade först. Så att det ska mycket till innan jag blir starstruck. Men när jag träffar Peter Hammerstedt så blir jag det. För att det är människor som han med hans hjärta och med hans integritet och med hans mod och med hans vilja som vi slutligen kommer förändra den här världen och det finns inget för mig som är större så det är en stor ära att få presentera Peter Hammarstedt. Tack för introduktionen, Nika. Uh, I think I'll do this speech in, in English because we have a lot of overseas guests here. We have a lot of people from Finland, Estonia and Denmark. And I'm incredibly nervous to speak today because it's the first time I'm speaking in my, my hometown of Stockholm. I have my parents here, my sister here, my partner here, some of my old friends here. And so I am a bit nervous 
uh, going into this. Sea Shepherd's not terribly well known uh, here in Sweden, although we have a massive display in the center of this wonderful veggie fair. But a lot of people haven't heard of Sea Shepherd before, and so I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about what we do and the things that make Sea Shepherd absolutely unique, that make Sea Shepherd like no other organization out there. Sea Shepherd is an international, it's a global organization that works to enforce international conservation law when governments lack either the political will or the economic means to do so. And in my time with Sea Shepherd, I've learned that there are four major things that make us very, very unique. The first thing is that Sea Shepherd is a law enforcement organization. We have a lot of the laws in place that we need to protect the oceans, but what's missing is for somebody to enforce those laws. Since 1986, there's been a ban on commercial whaling. It means that for the past two and a half decades, it has been unlawful to kill a whale. And yet ever since 1986, the governments of Japan, Iceland, and Norway have together killed over 40,000 whales. The Galapagos Islands, a World Heritage Site, a marine reserve, and one of the most precious ecosystems in the world, where Charles Darwin himself came up with this theory of evolution, is a place that is under daily attack by poachers targeting endangered sharks for their fins. So there are these laws, but what's missing is for somebody to enforce those laws, and that's where Sea Shepherd steps in. The second thing that makes us unique is that we measure our success by the number of lives that we save and by the number of criminal operations that we shut down. We don't measure our success by the number of glossy reports we put out because we don't put out any. We don't measure our success by our supporting members. We measure our success by how many lives we save. And in the past 10 years of going down to Antarctica protecting whales, we've saved over 5,000 whales. Heading down to Antarctica this last year, taking on these illegal fishing operations, we shut down two-thirds of illegal fishing. Those are the kind of results that we generate in exchange for your generous donations. The third thing that makes us unique is that we are a non-violent organization, but we are aggressively non-violent. Which means that it's never okay to hurt anybody, but at times you have to put your ship where it needs to be in order to protect life. For me, it's about being ethically consistent. If outside of the Viego Mess on here, we saw somebody kicking a dog, we wouldn't just take pictures of it happening. We wouldn't just call the police and wait for them to show up 15 minutes later while this person keeps kicking that dog. We wouldn't hang banners to protest it, and we wouldn't start a petition group or a Facebook group to stop it. I'm not a very big guy. My nickname on the ship is, is The Hammer but it's because of my surname Hamasteth, it's not because of my body mass or anything like this. But if I heard a case of domestic violence in, in the neighboring apartment to mine, I wouldn't just call the police and wait for them to show up half an hour later when that abuse was said and done. I would put my shoulder to that door and I would probably break my shoulder doing it, but I would do everything I could to get that door open because the reality is that evil prevails only when good people do nothing. The fourth thing that makes us unique is that our clients are not people. We don't represent people. We represent whales, we represent seals, we represent toothfish. That's, that's who we represent. And we don't really care what people think about us, which may sound a little bit strange, because I do hope that you'll come to our table and you'll become supporting members and wear Sea Shepherd gear, but the reality is that whether you support us today or not, we'll still scrape by with every tool now that we can muster because we're only answerable to those animals. What motivates me in particular is an experience that I had with a pilot whale about six years ago off the coast of Australia on the island of Tasmania, where 54 pilot whales had beached themselves, they'd stranded uh, because of navigation hazards. And so myself and five of my crew went down to this beachfront to, be, to try to get these pilot whales back out to sea. And we worked all day doing it. We got 53 out of these 54 pilot whales back out into the ocean before the weather turned for the worse. And the weather was terrible. The seas were big, the winds were strong. And for about two and a half days, we had to work tirelessly to keep this pilot whale alive. 
we had to keep her wet. We had to set up plastic in order to protect her from the wind. And I remember my job was measuring her breathing. And I remember for two and a half days counting down how her breathing slowed down to once every 30 seconds to once every two and a half minutes as she was getting more and more tired. And I remember her breath smelling like almost like curdled milk because of how dehydrated she was getting. On the third day, we finally had this open window in the weather. So myself and several of my crew carried her down to the water. We had two jet skis and a line in between which we used to tow her back out to sea. And by the time we got about 50 meters to 100 meters off the beachhead, she started struggling against the rope and broke free and then began to swim in a direction completely in the opposite from where we were taking her. And we couldn't understand why. But what we found out from our helicopter flying overhead is that just about two, three hundred meters to the west of us was the rest of her pod, the other 53 pilot whales. And when she rejoined them, they circled her and they nudged her and they played with her. And together, all 54 of those pilot whales swam out to sea together. They knew she was still stuck on that beach. And that story has really stuck with me and that experience has stuck with me because I think it's one of the strongest arguments for animal rights. Because these whales and a lot of these creatures we protect have the same kind of social structures and family structures that we have. And we have a lot more in common with animals than we have things that separate us from them. There's a big need for an organization like Sea Shepherd and the reason for that is that our oceans are in an absolute state of crisis. Out of the 17 fishing hotspots, areas of the world that throughout human history have been known to be teeming with fish, 16 of these places are exploited to collapse. Places like the Grand Banks off Newfoundland that have always had fish. Shark populations in the North Atlantic have fallen by 90% in just the past 50 years, and sharks are critical to the health of our ecosystems as apex predators. Bluefin tuna, some of the biggest fish to swim the sea. Incredible creatures are down to 3% bluefin tuna. 3% of what they were 30 years ago. So you would think that our governments would get together and they would put in place laws and they would get the Navy on board to enforce those laws, but they don't. 3% is what remains. What Sea Shepherd has to do is fill those law enforcement voids where they exist. And where I see them existing is with illegal fishing. Because as we're seeing the absolute decimation and overfishing of our oceans, we're hit with the statistic that 15 to 40 percent of all the fish caught globally is caught by illegal, unregulated, and unreported operators. Almost half of the fish caught globally, especially off the coast of Africa, is caught by illegal fishing vessels. And it's information like that that led to Operation Ice Fish, which you just saw a video of. There were 40 crew wearing life jackets that abandoned the most wanted poaching vessel in the world as it sank off the coast of West Africa. The captain of the Thunder, after having been chased for 110 days, covering 11,000 nautical miles across three oceans, decided to sink his own ship in an ill-fated decision to destroy the evidence on board because he could not shake the pursuit of the Sea Shepherd vessels following him. Now, Operation Icefish was a really ambitious plan to track down, shut down, and bring to justice the Bandit Six, these six toothfish poaching operators that for over a decade had broken international conservation law targeting vulnerable populations of Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish. And these toothfish are like the sharks. They're apex predators in the Antarctic ecosystem, so they're absolutely critical to maintaining the ecosystem balance down in the Southern Ocean. Now the plan for Operation Icefish was really quite simple. In fact, it was so simple that nobody had ever tried it before. The course for my sister ship, the Sam Simon, was set early on as my colleague, Captain Siddharth Chakravarti trawled the shipyards of Mumbai buying derelict parts from broken down ships in order to build a makeshift net hauling device. Because the mission 
for the Sam Simon was to confiscate any illegal gill net that it came across, to put any of these weapons of mass destruction out of action. But the future for my ship, the Bob Barker, was a lot more uncertain because our plan was to follow any poaching vessel that we found and to continue to follow them until law enforcement took over our citizens' arrest. And I remember being in Wellington, New Zealand when Captain Sidhart Chakravarty asked me how long would we be willing to pursue those ships for? And not knowing the answer to that, I said, well, I guess we'll follow them for however long it takes. The reason we have to follow them is that these poachers had avoided arrest for over 10 years. And the way they did it was by changing their name and changing their flag and changing their registry constantly. An Australian police plane would fly overhead, would document their criminal activity, and when the plane crossed over the horizon, the ship would already be operating under a different name. As an example of that, when the thunder finally sank, emblazoned on a removable nameplate on the stern was the name Thunder. It was a nameplate you could screw off. We called it a James Bond license plate. The life raft that the crew got into, they had the name Typhoon One on them, which was the previous name. And the life jackets worn by the crew, Ming number five. That's how many names the ship had gone through in just the eight months that law enforcement had lost them for. So what the Bob Barker was going to do is we were going to be this spotlight, this spotlight that lit up the shadowy world of these criminal operators. We were going to be this loud hailer, biting at the heels of these poaching vessels, proclaiming to the world, this is where they are, right here, right now, giving real-time intelligence to law enforcement. Operation Icefish really began when the Bob Barker, my ship, set sail from Hobart, Australia. Our sister ship, the Sam Simon, left from Wellington, New Zealand. And it took us about two weeks to get down to what we call the Shadowlands of the Southern Ocean. And this is the single most remote area of water in the world. It's two weeks sailing from the nearest port. We had to think like fishermen. So I remember looking over our charts, comparing the charted depths with the information we had on where there were toothfish, compared to where we knew there were legal fishing boats operating. And two days into our search is when we struck gold. I remember the day very well. Visibility was in and out. There was heavy fog, so sometimes we could only see half a mile ahead of the bow. That's how thick the fog was. There were icebergs in every single direction. So my radar screen was littered with potential targets. Because the visibility was so bad, I sent one of my crew members aloft up in the foremast so that they could keep a lookout to see if there was any fishing gear in the water. And just two hours after they went up the foremast, we saw a set of orange buoys in the water. We knew that they had to be close. Staring at the radar screen, one of these targets began to move. It had to be a ship. And as I sped up my vessel to intercept them, I grabbed a binder from my bridge which was a collection of photographs of wanted poaching ships, basically mug shots of poachers. And as the vessel appeared through the fog and I saw the side of the ship, I knew with 95% certainty that we'd found the thunder. But I had to know for sure. Quickening the pace of the Bob Barker, the thunder turned north and started to run away from us at full speed. And it took about two hours to catch up to them, but once I did, I could see the name on the back, Thunder, Lagos, Nigeria, and I knew that we had found the most notorious, the most wanted poaching vessel in the world, wanted by Interpol. I radioed the captain of the Thunder and I asked him what he was doing, to which he replied in Spanish that he was simply passing through the area. And I felt a little bit like one of those police officers in one of those really bad American cop shows that you see on TV, who after running across several city blocks, jumping over some fences, they finally have the suspect on the ground, hands behind their back, and the suspect is screaming, I didn't do anything wrong. To which the police officer, panting and out of breath, asks, well then why did you run? And that is how the longest chase began. The first thing that the Thunder tried to do was to lose us through the heavy ice flows off the coast of Antarctica. But following them through that was easy. We simply just traced the line 
the warm line that their wake drew through the ice. They then tried to lose us in the heavy seas of the Southern Ocean, some of the heaviest seas that the Southern Oceans have to offer. 10 meter seas beat and battered the Bob Barker as we chased them north. And finally, in the warm water south of Madagascar, the thunder came to a complete stop. Their strategy became one of simply trying to wait us out, testing our patience, testing our resolve, and hoping that we would give up. Parallel to that, our sister ship, the San Simon, began the monumental task of confiscating this illegal gill net abandoned by the thunder. And working four hours on, four hours off for four weeks, they pulled in all 72 kilometers of this gill net, prohibited by law, abandoned by the thunder. Board, the Sam Simon located another two of the bandit six, another two of these poaching vessels, the Kun Loon and the Yong Ding. They escorted the Kun Loon out of the fishing grounds before heading to Mauritius to turn over the net as evidence in their eventual prosecution. Meanwhile, in the warm water south of Madagascar, the Bob Barker had begun a period which we referred to as the Great Drift. And speculation was our favorite pastime on board. It was also our most hated pastime as we wondered when would this vessel get going again? How much fuel did they have on board? When would this chase be over? And I remember one day in particular when my chief engineer from Holland, Erwin Vermeulen, came up to the bridge with my fuel soundings for the day, the amount of fuel we had on board. And because we weren't running our engine, we were only burning the fuel that our generator consumed, I did some quick calculations and determined that we could be at sea for potentially two years. And so then I went down into the galley and I got my chief cook uh, from Australia and I asked her, Priya, do we have enough food to stay out of sea for two years? To which she replied, we have enough rice and we have enough beans to survive at sea for two years. And that was undoubtedly the most difficult time of this chase. Fifty days into the drift, the Thunder decided to try to resume their criminal operations. I saw the trawl door open on the stern, a set of buoys thrown out the back, and I brought the Bob Barker behind them, pulled up those buoys, cut them from the net, and that was the last time that they tried to fish. As long as we were with them, they could not deploy their illegal gill net. On board the Bob Barker, we were relieved that now, finally, this ship was moving again. And we chased the thunder around the Cape of Good Hope. We chased them north, past Namibia, past Angola, Congo, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, until finally, 90 nautical miles west of the small West African country of Sao Tome and Principe, the thunder came to a stop. It was the morning of the 6th of April. I was called up to the bridge because the thunder had stopped. And that wasn't unusual, it was stop and go a lot of the time. But this time was a bit different because the crew were coming out on deck wearing life jackets. I stood on my bridge watching as they threw a life raft over the side, a boarding ladder to follow it. But still I'd heard no distress alert or distress call, no mayday had been put out. So I radioed the captain of the thunder and I asked him if everything was okay. To which he replied, almost as if he'd forgotten a very important step in his day of sinking his own ship. He said, that's right, I'm sinking, I'm sinking, this is a mayday. And I asked, do you require assistance? To which he said, yes, and I put a small boat in the water. My partner, Lex, up there spent 10 hours in the water rescuing the crew of the Thunder, bringing them onto our sister ship, the Sam Simon. But before the ship sank, I was put in a probably the most difficult decision-making position I've ever been in with Sea Shepherd. As once again, my Dutch chief engineer, Erwin Vermeulen, came up to the bridge and asked me for permission to board the sinking ship after it had been abandoned to see what evidence we could gather on board as to their criminal activity and what caused the sinking. I thought about it for a little bit and then somewhat reluctantly said, okay, you can go on board the ship, but you can't stay more than five minutes. On board the ship, what they found was damning evidence of the ship being sunk. All of the doors and all of the hatches had been left open, tied open, chained open, so that water could move from one area of the ship to the next. 
On board the bridge, we've gathered computer information, hard drives, mobile phones, and nautical charts, all of which we later turned over to Interpol. And down in their fish hold, we found what they were fishing for, which was a Patagonian toothfish, which we brought up and brought onto the Bob Barker as well. We turned the Thunder crew over to the authorities in Sao Tome and Principe. And just one and a half months ago, after charging the captain and two of his officers with fraud, with criminal negligence, with pollution to the environment and damages to the environment, a court in Sao Tome and Principe sentenced these three men to three years in prison and 15 million euros in fine, the strongest fines ever delivered against an illegal fishing boat. I remember the third day of trial really, really well because that was the day when the captain of the Thunder, Rubio Cataldo, stood up and delivered his defense. And I watched him as he stood up in front of this court and said that he feared that we had, were going to collide with his ship, that he feared for the life of him and his crew as we followed them for these 110 days, that never in his time at sea had he been so frightened. So the judge asked me for my opinion on it, and I stood up in court and I said, Your Honor, with, with, with all due respect, we were faster than that ship. We were more maneuverable than the Thunder. If we wanted to collide with them, we could collide with them the first day and save ourselves 110 days of trouble. But that's not what we're about, and that's not what we did. In fact, on the first day, as soon as we found them, the first thing we did was we called the police. And for 110 days, every single day, we informed the police as to where the ship was. When these men sank their own ship, we rescued them. They wouldn't even be here in this court if it wasn't for us. And when Sao Tome and Principe decided to charge these men and bring them to justice, then we came here to court and we presented evidence. We worked with Nigeria, the flag state of the Thunder, and when the Thunder finally sank, Captain Waredi Inesu, the director of shipping for Nigeria, said that never in his experience had two ships sacrificed so much to bring just one to justice. And Your Honor, that's why we are here today in pursuit of justice. The reality is that it wasn't just the sacrifice of two ships that finally ended the 12-year plundering career of the Thunder. It was the dedication, the generosity, the hard work, and the support of people like you, tens of thousands of people around the world supporting us, their sacrifices, that finally did what the police could not do in 12 years, which was to stop this ship. Out of the bandit six, one is, sits at a depth of 3,800 meters in the Gulf of Guinea. Another three are detained in ports in Cabo Verde, in Malaysia. But two of these poachers remain. And we consider these poachers to be fugitives from justice. So with your support, and I hope that you'll go to the Sea Shepherd information table, today is the premiere of Sea Shepherd Scandinavia. So you can ask these wonderful volunteers from Sweden and Denmark how you can get involved. But I ask you if you can support us today then we will head back down south in the middle of December. We'll go down to the scene of the crime. We'll track down these fugitives. We'll once again shut down their criminal operations. And we'll drag them into the halls of justice if we have to. That's where they belong. Thank you very much. So what I... What I thought I would do now is uh, we can open it for some questions. You can ask them in Swedish if you want. Uh, I'm, I'll answer in English so that everyone can understand. But if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to open up for those for the next 10 minutes or so. The question is, how did I get involved uh, with Sea Shepherd? Well, the answer to that is I was 17, 18 years old. Uh, I was volunteering with Greenpeace here in Stockholm. And Iceland, our neighbors to the west, had made the decision to try to rejoin the International Whaling Commission, which is the legal body that governs whaling worldwide. And it seems a little bit strange, the International Whaling Commission has banned whaling, 
but in order to whale, you have to be a member of the IWC. So Iceland was reapplying so that they could do so-called scientific whaling. And the votes that got Iceland back in was 19 votes to 18. And the deciding vote that allowed Iceland to rejoin the IWC and subsequently kill hundreds upon hundreds of fin whales and minke whales was a vote that was cast by Sweden. Sweden cast the deciding vote. And it was the wrong vote to make. Uh, the Swedish delegate had two reports in front of them. One was a recommendation by the Foreign Affairs Department, the Utekis Departementa. One was from the Environmental Affairs Office, Minio Departementa. But uh, the minister or the delegate went with the Foreign Affairs dossier, which of course puts diplomacy above all else, and that was, that was not what he was supposed to do. Sweden asked for a recall and a re-vote. That wasn't given. And I remember sitting at home in Stockholm thinking, okay, Sweden voted incorrectly and it was stupidly done. But because of some bureaucratic, nonsensical thing, they can't do a re-vote, and now hundreds upon hundreds of whales have to die in Iceland because of some bureaucratic nonsense. And so I looked for the only group that was heading to Iceland at the time, and, and, that, and that was Sea Shepherd. And that, that's why I applied to join, and that's what I've been doing since. Sorry, very, very hard to hear you up there. Have we been vapenhotade? Uh, the question is, have we ever been threatened with, uh, by weapons before? And the answer to that is yes. But one of the strange things about uh, chasing the thunder is when I finally saw these three men in court in Sao Tome and Principe, it was the first time I'd seen their faces without wearing balaclavas and ski masks. So that was very unusual. We tried to communicate with the Indonesian crew who were working on board there as the low-waged, basically slave labor on board that ship. And when we tried to pass messages in a bottle to them, the Thunder officers who were from Spain and, and uh, Chile would come out and they would throw things at the crew, metal implements, and, and things like that. In previous campaigns, our ships have been fired upon. Uh, they've been fired upon by navies at times, because sometimes it happens that poaching is sponsored by government. Uh, but we, we are willing to take these risks because we have to. Because we, it's that recognition that we are at times the only thing standing between life and death for these animals. So the, the question is, why did these, uh, the captain and the two officers get three years? And that's a very good question. Uh, the difficulty for Sao Tome and Principe was how to target the fisheries crime that happened in Antarctica. And that's a very, fisheries crimes are very difficult to prosecute because for one, usually these ships use what are called flags of convenience. So they flag to countries where it's very difficult to make the ship responsible. If there's a Swedish fishing boat that's fishing illegally, it's very easy. You go to Kuefaltsvaket here, and, you, and, and there's usually a process. But if the ships, like the Thunder, are flagged to Nigeria, Mongolia was a very common registry for fishing boats, Sierra Leone, for a time these poachers flagged in North Korea. And you can imagine if Australian Customs finds a North Korean fishing boat in Antarctic waters and they report it to Pyongyang, you can imagine how far that is going to go. So the difficulty is always jurisdiction. And what Sao Tome and Principe could do is they only had jurisdiction of what happened in Sao Tome waters. So they could go for them for the sinking of the ship and the pollution charge, and also for having a fraudulent fishing license. Because the fishing license they had issued by Nigeria was fraudulent, and that was still on board the vessel. We'd taken that off when we searched through the ship. So that was the only avenue they could attack them. And it's been a big problem with fisheries crimes, is how to get them for the actual illegal fishing. And so Interpol uses kind of like, if you know, if you've heard of Al Capone, Al Capone was this big criminal gangster boss in the, in the US. And try as they might, the FBI could not get him for the murders, they could not get him for the gambling, 
they had to get him for tax fraud. But it was the it was the tax violations that put him in Alcatraz for 12 years and where he ultimately died. So what, what Interpol does with illegal fishing boats is they sometimes have to look at all the crimes connected to the actual fishery crime. So that's making fake customs declarations, it's having fake papers for the registry of the boat or for the fishing license, it's human trafficking, things like that. You just have to get them for something. The difficult thing is tackling ownership because the Thunder was registered in Nigeria, that company was then owned by a company in Panama, and that company their board of directors is secret, but what is good is we do know who the owner is now because the owner made an insurance claim on loss of the vessel, and so the, their own greed becomes their kind of downfall. But what is good is that Spain recently passed legislation where any Spanish citizen who's fishing illegally on a foreign boat can actually be charged under Spanish law. So all the Spanish crew on board that ship are facing potential charges in Spain, and that's legislation that's potentially going to be added to other European countries as well. That was a very long answer to your question. Yeah. The question is how do we finance our operations? Our operations are incredibly expensive to run. To give you an idea, just the fuel alone on the Bob Barker, the ship that, that I'm in charge of, just the fuel alone would cost about say 40 to 50,000 kroner a day just to run the ship. So it's, it's an incredible amount of money. Uh, the kind of bread and butter that we have, or the bread and soy margin that we have, is the people who donate monthly. And so we have monthly donors who donate every month, and that's money that we can budget from. We have some celebrity supporters. Uh, the Bob Barker was purchased through the support of Bob Barker, who's an American television personality. Uh, the sister ship Sam Simon was named after Sam Simon, who his, he passed away, unfortunately, two years ago, but he was one of the cr uh, creators of the Simpsons television show. And so he bought us that ship and we named it in his honor. But ultimately, it's people buying merchandise, it's people becoming monthly donors, and all those kind of things that you can do at the stall just, just next door to here if you want to get more involved. And also our ships are run primarily by volunteers. So 90% of our crew are volunteers, and that cuts down on the costs considerably. Any other questions? Uh, the question is, how does government uh, see Sea Shepherd around the world? And, and that, that varies quite a bit. What we found is we have projects, for example, in the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, where we work together with the Ecuadorian environmental police. We have a dog sniffer unit that is trained to sniff for uh, wildlife smuggling products. And there we work very closely with the police. We work with the police in Cabo Verde off the coast of West Africa and trying to stop poaching there. We worked with Interpol through the pursuit of the thunder. When we oppose whaling, for example, down in the Southern Ocean, that's poaching that's sponsored by the government of Japan, and uh, uh subsidized by the government of Japan. So then it becomes very, very difficult. And of course, then the government of Japan calls us criminals and calls us all kinds of things. What we found is that very wealthy countries, uh, Ilanda will call us all kinds of terrible bad names, whereas Ulenda in countries that are developing countries will often invite us in with our equipment and you know, with our expertise to actually help enforce laws. So it, it varies very much globally. Yep. How do they sink the thunder? Well, we don't really know exactly how they did it. What we know is that the engine room was full of water. The captain of the thunder spent about three hours on his ship refusing to leave the boat. And that was incredibly frustrating for me because I wanted to be able to account for all 40 of the, of the people on the ship. And I remember one time, very strangely, he said, okay, if you don't hear from me in 15 minutes, don't worry, it's because my VHF radio has run out of batteries. So I said, well, that's not a problem. We've got, we have VHF handheld, so we can pass one over to you. Uh, to which he said, oh, no, that's okay, that's not gonna be a problem. 
And of course, if you're in a distressed situation, your ship is sinking, you want to be able to maintain communication at all times. My, my theory is that he went down to the engine room because the last people to leave the ship were him and his engineers to make sure that the ship was sinking. So they obviously opened something in the engine room. Uh, that was full completely with water when my crew went on board and then the ship sank from there. But what was strange was that everything had been left open. Even the doors to the refrigeration and the freezer room, everything had been left open. So it was, it was very obvious and in court they certainly couldn't explain how, how that came about and how that happened. Sorry, one second. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The question is, did it take a lot of work to bring the thunder up? And, and the, the thunder is still down there. So the thunder sank. It's at 3,800 meters. I don't think anybody will ever see that ship again. I don't think James Cameron's going to spend millions of dollars to send down ROVs and investigate it. I don't think that's going to happen. So the, the ship is the ship is done, and uh, it'll unfortunately what was on board, of course, was thousands upon thousands of, of bunker oil, and of course that will leak out over time, and that's one of the reasons they were given this 15 million euro fine was because of those damages to the environment. So one of, the, one of the reasons that we suspected them of human trafficking is that it's a very common uh, theme throughout illegal fishing and through the legal fishing industry as well, globally, where as there's fewer and fewer fish, there's fewer things that a, a fishing boat can reduce on. So uh, fishing ships have to stay out longer, they have to go out further, and they have to use even better and better technology to catch fewer and fewer fish. The costs they can't reduce are they're going to burn as much fuel no matter what. It's going to cost as much for their officers no matter what. Their equipment costs the same. Their berthing for offloading the fish. Those are costs that are constant even as they have to stay out longer and go out further. So the only thing that they can press down on in order to catch fewer and fewer fish is labor costs. And that's why we saw in the 70s and 80s, especially with fishing vessels, a lot of the labor for the actual working in the fish factory was coming from Indonesia and from the Philippines. So most of these workers then are getting paid maybe $250 a month. They sign on to contracts that are two to three years. Usually the crewing agency they sign up with back in Indonesia will take half of their wages for the first six months. Usually when the Indonesian seaman goes to sign up for the job, they have to provide the deed of their house so that if they break the contract within, before those two or three years are up, then they lose their home. You can imagine that if you're out at sea for two years, some of these crew go out to sea for three years without seeing land. And that's because to stay out longer and to go out further, a lot of these fishing boats use uh, reefer ships, refrigeration ships to offload the fish at sea, which makes it very difficult to track the fish. 